Welcome to Roadshow Rivals, where we bring together the best of the best and tell you which machine you should take home. Today it's sports sedans, and we are graced by the presence of two cars that epitomize the breed, BMW's iconic M3 and the Mercedes AMG C63. But that's not enough, not for you. We've also brought the Cadillac ATS-V, a car that was seemingly purpose-built to knock these Teutonic Titans down a peg or two. We're gonna be testing these cars on the road, out here on the track, and at the end, we'll crown a winner. We'll start with the youngest of the bunch. This is the Cadillac ATS-V. It's powered by a 3.6 liter twin turbo V6 with 464 horsepower. That'll get you from zero to 60 in just 3.8 seconds. At least it will if you have the eight-speed automatic. We're running the six-speed manual transmission because, well, it's more fun that way. Now you can get in this car for as little as $61,000. Ours as configured will set you back just over $70,000. And if you think that's expensive, wait until you hear how much the other two cost. Well, yes, if you're gonna go straight for the jugular, then yes, this 2016 BMW M3 is more expensive. A baseline of $63,000 expensive, and this one is specced all the way up to $81,425. But for that, you're getting a badge with the most proven track record in this sector and the best German engineering money can buy. Yes, it is slower to 60 at 3.9 seconds with the optional DCT gearbox, and it has 40 fewer horses under the bonnet at 425 from its three liter inline six cylinder engine. But you just can't be a Beamer, can you? Actually, Drew, I think I can. Now, you may remember the last C63. It's one of my all time favorite cars. Loud, Larry, really happy going sideways and just shredding tires. I know the other guys are gonna give me a hard time. They've been talking about it all day. This is the most expensive car here and by a significant margin. This is the high-end S model and I'll be honest, it's 92 grand. 92 grand. Game on indeed. Let's start things where you should always start things with a drag race. beat the Mercedes, but I did get the BMW. That's uh, that's something to be proud of, I think. Now, we're going to do a lot more performance testing, so stay tuned for that, but we also want to give you an overview of the interior technology. Drew is going to go through that, but first, Chris is going to give you a walkthrough of the design of these cars. All right, so we've seen this film before. Everybody loves a good blockbuster, and the M3 is the blockbuster of all blockbusters. So this bulging hood really telegraphs the power that lurks within. It's like it's, the engine's trying to break out. The thing that you notice most about the profile is the way the design highlights the wheels. They're 19 inches, and this one has carbon ceramic brakes, which this wheel pattern does a really great job of showing off because it's so open and almost hollow. And you can see the gold calipers. It tells everybody how much money you spent on them. So you wouldn't expect the rear fenders to be special on a car, but in this case, they're the showpiece feature. They're flared, and the BMW is the only car in this group that gets its own unique rear fenders. That's really, really expensive, but it also tells you that it's important to BMW to telegraph that this is a rear wheel drive car and it's got real road presence. So the C63 is based on the C-Class, which everybody acknowledges looks a lot like a shrunken down S-Class. Now that's a very fine thing, that's not an unattractive car, but it also means that there's a lot of work to be done to make it look like a high performance machine. All right, so this is still very clearly a Mercedes Benz. I mean, look at the logo size. It looks like it stretches out onto the hood, except you know what? They put another logo up there. The profile of the C63 AMG is pretty much garden variety C-Class, which means it's got a clean body side but they've tried to tack on a little bit of frosting here and there to make you realize it's special. Unlike the BMW, there's no huge bulge in the hood. So everybody needs to know what you're driving. And right here on the side, V8 bi-turbo. Very clearly says, mine's bigger than yours. So if you're not sure if you want to fully commit to the sports sedan thing, 
or if you've got a spouse that you've got to sneak a car by, this is probably the one to do it with because it's the one that looks most like a luxury sedan and least like a sports sedan. This is the Cadillac ATS-V, as if you need me to tell you that. This is the most distinctive looking car here. It's one of the most distinctive looking cars on the road. That's because Cadillac has the craziest styling language of any mass market brand. It's all hard lines and angles. Nothing else looks like a Cadillac on the road today. The whole front end of the ATS-V says, I need to breathe. It's got huge air intakes down low. It's a layer cake of chevrons. It's pointed, it says I'm going down the road and I'm gonna get there ahead of you. Like the front end of the ATS-V, the back end is drawn to a point as well. And that's rammed home by everything from the trunk lid to this massive rear spoiler on the top. And it may not be for everybody, but that's precisely the point. For right now, this is the most aggressive car here, and it's the one that's probably gonna get the most attention. On the inside, the ATS-V isn't as appealing as its German stablemates, as is seen in the slightly cheaper finish that everything seems to have. My main gripe is this very glossy plastic interface we have here. There are other touches that slightly get my gripe. This kind of fake style carbon fiber we see in places dotted around isn't too great. And the stuff that is quite nice, this Alcantara style leather up here, there's far too little of it. There is one thing particularly unique about the ATS-V that I do like a lot. A slight swipe of the finger here reveals a hidden compartment for your phone that not only has air conditioning in it to keep your device cool, it has an induction charging plate there. If your phone is compatible and it fits, that could be an exceptionally handy little feature to have. The Q system is possibly the weakest of the three. Although it does have a very similar feature set, the interface is a bit laggy, a bit slow, and these big chunky options may be quite useful, but the buttons don't always work exactly how you want them to. There's a small camera tucked up here behind the rear view mirror that can record your progress on track and overlay your track data. When you add that to the Wi-Fi system available in this car, this actually has some features that the Germans on this test don't have. The BMW has the most basic interior out of the three cars we have here today. There are some nice touches. The carbon fiber here and here looks great. And these M badges in the backs of the seats light up at night, a little bit garish, but I quite like it. The rest of the dash though is a little bit chunky and frankly a little bit 80s. Even the Cadillac, although I don't like the finish, way more effort has gone into making it a far more exciting place. Everything on the screen is controlled with this jog wheel here that has both turn, left, right, up, down, and this is touch screen. So for inputting your navigation, you can use this to draw numbers and letters. It's quite responsive and fun to use, but for me personally, it still isn't a good replacement for good voice control, which this has as well. BMW make driving machines. They don't make cabins that are as attractive as they possibly could be. If you count that against the car, then the BMW definitely comes out last. If you're going on looks alone, the Mercedes wins hands down. This interior feels sculpted and crafted. It might be an acquired taste, but I love this carbon cum wood stuff that's on this monolithic dash. It is simple, it is chunky, but it looks really, really good. I don't like the placing of the screen, it feels tacked on, and I'm still not a great fan of the two or three different ways that you're expected to control it, either through this dial or through the swipey thing. I like one clear way of doing these things rather than three or four. That said though, this actual control section is very, very attractive. Attractive is a word that's just carried throughout. The stitching, the leather, everything you touch, everything you can see, looks great. The feature offering is relatively standard. It doesn't necessarily have much that any of the other cars in this test don't have, but it's presented in a way that looks classy. All right, so we're on a winding road in the ATS-V and the first thing you notice feels tight, feels light, feels good. And while it has plenty of power in all the right places, one thing it doesn't have compared to the competition is noise. It's really quiet, even when you get on it. In isolation, it sounds all right, especially from behind you, but inside the car, it really doesn't have that auditory feedback that you want. It's got good chassis feel, it settles down very well when you go over rises just like we just did. 
and it also has good steering feel. You can point the wheels and they go exactly where you want them to and you can also feel what the tread blocks are doing. Sometimes it's easy to fix a problem when you're developing a car. If you have a cheap interior, you throw more money at it, you get better plastics. But when it comes to chassis development, that's sort of a black art and it's something that not everybody gets right, but Cadillac has nailed it here. So the M3 has always been the class standard because of the way it handles. And on some level that's still true with this car, but you have to fiddle with a lot of buttons in order to get it exactly right. There's three different modes for the steering, there's three different modes for the throttle response, three different modes for the dampers, and that's just a lot of fiddling to do on a day in, day out basis. But just listen to that twin turbo six sing. It handles beautifully. You just want a little bit more eager turn in, but this is among the lightest cars here and it feels it on these roads. So let's talk about chassis balance for a minute. The M3 compared to most any other vehicle is great, but then when you put it next to the Cadillac, it's just missing a little something. And I don't know if it's just that the Cadillac is a little bit tighter of wheelbase and a little bit more eager to change directions, but the transient responses with the M3 aren't quite as good as with the Cadillac. And that's a shocker. So I tell you what, the M3 sounds great, but I prefer this. The, there's nothing like a V8 sound, forced induction or no, and this has it all going on all the time. It's never quiet. Even when you've got the exhaust switched off, it's still loud, it's still there, and it's just a reminder that you're in something wonderful. So on the track, as we discovered, this is not the finely tuned scalpel you might want all the time. It's sideways, it's loud, it's shredding tires. On the street, that is kind of what you want, honestly, because it lends a sense of occasion to whatever you do, whether you're pulling away from a stoplight and you're smoking the tires and you're making the engine sound as great as it can. I mean, listen to this. It's fantastic. And the brakes? The brakes are really good in this car. So listen, this is the biggest car here. You might think it would be clumsy on a mountain road or on a windy road like this one, but it actually sits really well. Because the suspension is so firm, everything feels pretty dialed in and you can go around a corner and you can actually feel as you go around the corner what the tires are doing in a way that you simply can't in the M3. start on the track in BMW's iconic M3. This is the car that has defined what a sports sedan should be for decades. And this one's got the optional carbon ceramic brakes, which I actually didn't like on the street. I thought they were way too grippy, but out here on the track, pretty nice option. The brake feel is great, and lap after lap, no fade at all. However, the car sort of has a tendency to understeer, which doesn't make it the most fun as a track toy. I've got everything up to Sport Plus, as racy as it'll go, it just sort of gradually understeers out of the turn. It's only when you turn the traction control all the way off that this thing comes alive. But when I say alive, I mean alive. You better be wide awake before you hold down that traction control button. Next up is the Mercedes AMG C63, which we've already identified has the nicest interior. It also has the nicest seats for going on track. They're incredibly adjustable and very, very supportive, which means they squeeze you in all the right places to hold you in place when you're out here on the track. Now, this is the only car of the three with a flappy paddle gearbox, which does make it a little bit less involving, but it does allow for quick, accurate shifts every time. And the uh, nice bark that you get every time you downshift is pretty nice, too. Now, being the most sophisticated car of the three, you might think that it'd be the most boring on the track, you would be wrong. This car is an absolute monster out here. Even with the traction control on, it is very, very happy to kick the tail out at every opportunity. Now, last but certainly not least is the Cadillac ATS-V, and this is going to sound a little weird about a Cadillac, but it's probably the best balanced of the three. It's also got the most advanced technology, believe it or not, for on-track driving. 
It's got five separate track modes that'll dial you all the way from a race track that's wet all the way up to something that's totally dry. It's got a flat shift so you can shift without taking your right foot off the gas. A little rev match if you want it to. I don't want it to. And it's got a performance data recorder built into the mirror here. So it'll capture 720p video and overlay that with everything that you're doing on the track, which is great for YouTube later. Overall, it feels really nicely balanced on the track. Even with the traction controller on, it understeers a little bit if you get in too hot like I did there. But uh, it'll power slide right out if you want it to. Really nice car. Well, uh, that was fun. <laughs> but the key question is, how do they compare? You know, it's interesting. I would have expected the Mercedes to be the most civilized on track, but it is completely the opposite. It's the most crazy by far. The M3 is the most civilized, a little bit boring even, until you turn the traction control all the way off. And then at that point, you're, you're kind of on your own. Now, I have had that car out at Road America, which is a much bigger track with longer straights. A lot more fun there, but on a tight, twisty track like we had here, it just wasn't all that much fun, to be honest. I was really surprised. The Cadillac was the most rewarding to drive by far. All the different traction control modes, they were all a lot of fun. So you always had that safety blanket keeping you safe. Yeah, you know, it's a more nimble car. It's got a shorter wheelbase. And in general, what we're dealing with here is three different approaches to the same problem. You know, what's the, the sports sedan? You got the BMW down there. That's sort of the standard, the icon, the prism by which these vehicles are measured. It looks like a lot like a standard 3 Series to me that's just been amped up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you get that it's special because it's got a little extra width. You've, you've got the bottom breathers there and, and all that. Then you've got the Cadillac in here, which is sort of like the axe-wielding madman. It's just crazy. <laughs> it's all slashes and angles and, and all that. And it really says that I'm the special car here. Oh, and then we got the Mercedes here. And uh, it's like it can't really quite decide what it wants to be. Does it want to be luxury or does it want to be sports? So it sort of telegraphs both. And it's got this huge badge in the front, so it tells you it's about the badge. It's about luxury. <laughs> it's got a lot of chrome and bits and all of that. And then it's got this sort of saggy rear end. It can't decide what it wants to be. Nobody likes a saggy rear end, especially on a $90,000 sports sedan. Yeah, again with the cost, huh? <laughs> well, in terms of interior features, there's a very similar lineup of availability. And some things are down to how you like to interact with your tech. But in terms of aesthetics, the Mercedes wins hands down. The best mm -hmm. looking interior of the bunch, without shadow of a doubt. The BMW, they are harking back to the 80s with a lot of the design cues, big chunky buttons, the old LED style displays. It's an acquired taste, but if you have it, it's spot on. The actual aesthetics of the Cadillac are horrible. The, the gloss plastic finish is just a fingerprint magnet and it feels very, very cheap. And the cue system is not great. It's not great. <laughs> You're being very polite. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not amazing. <laughs> but if you add into the fact that it has some great extra features, that forward-facing camera with the track data overlay, really cool. Having a power outlet in the back, if you're a business customer who's gonna be using this every day, that's gonna come in handy. And having that 4G LTE system on board Wi-Fi, well, we've been using it loads while we've had All these the cars. It makes it really hard not to count this car as the most feature-packed of the bunch. I have to give it to the ATS-V. Wow, that's, uh, that's surprising. All right, so design, you're going Caddy as well? Uh, you know, I am going to go with the Caddy because it feels the most special. And a lot of these cars are leased, right? So they're short-term purchases. And this feels like the most of-the-moment car. I don't know how well it's going to age, but for right now, it looks fantastic. It's also the cheapest of the bunch. By a fair margin, yeah. Does that mean we have a winner? I, we might have to go that way. If factoring the cost, then I can get over a lot of its foibles. I, I think I think we might have chosen the Cadillac as the best. It's the best on the track. A lot of tech inside. I didn't see that coming, actually. I didn't either. Yeah. So there you have it. A surprise winner of Roadshow Rivals, the Cadillac ATS-V.